Church Evangelism, Lecture 30. We have been talking about the clarity in evangelism because we want to be clear when we share the good news of Christ. But I have found that when it comes to clarity, the area that needs the most work in church evangelism is how we communicate the appropriation of grace. That is, after we have shared the good news of salvation by grace to them, how do we close the deal and get them to appropriate or receive the salvation that's offered to them? While I was preparing this lecture, I was also preparing to fly out of state for a few days on business. Did you know that the most dangerous part of air travel is at the end of the flight, when the plane lands? If you are going to be in a plane crash, your chances are greatest just before you touch down. In fact, not too long ago, there was a group of young people from China who made it all the way to the United States only to have the pilot misjudge the runway and crash the plane on the way in. In the same way, wouldn't it be a great tragedy if our gospel presentation brought some people most of the way, but we didn't have the skills to finish the flight? Do you remember the former missionary to Budapest, Hungary, who wrote for help just a few lectures back? and said he didn't truly grasp salvation. After I read his email, I wrote him back and shared the gospel with him by forwarding him two of the lectures in this course, which I sent to him in a written format. Each lecture I sent was one that you have already heard, which included the Old Testament teaching and colored Christ within the lines. After seeing the gospel illustrated in those Old Testament stories, praise God, the fog began to lift, and the idea of salvation finally made sense to him. And that's great, but now comes the landing. I mean, for many people, when they first hear and understand the gospel, faith in Christ comes as natural to them as nursing does to a baby. Once they see Jesus on that cross, they just reach out and take him, and that's the way it should be. But for many others, the concept of faith can prove a difficult thing for them to wrap their minds around, especially if they are analytical people like me, or if they have had prior misunderstandings of the gospel, like our former missionary friend did. For these people, even after they understand the truth of what Christ has done for them on the cross, how to actually have faith in that truth and be saved by it is sometimes still hard for them to understand. This is exactly the position the former missionary was in after he read the lecture I sent to him that explained the atonement of Christ. Listen to what he said when he wrote back. He said, quote, I believe in the atonement of Christ's death and that it was 100% for me and every other sinner in the world. But how to access the reality of it, I draw a blank. It's as if there is an account filled with millions of dollars that was opened in my name, but I don't know how to access it. Like I'm standing there dumbfounded with the ATM card and can't punch in the right code. What is faith? How do I believe and trust? End of quote. So, we have a man who now understands the gospel, but who still must appropriate the gospel as a possession of his own. 
In other words, the plane has made it to the airport, but it still has to land. And this is why you evangelistic workers in the church need to realize how critical it is that you not only clearly communicate the blessing of the gospel, but you also clearly communicate what a man must do to receive the benefit of that blessing. In churches that believe in salvation by grace through faith, their most common evangelistic errors do not occur during their presentation of the gospel, but during the closing of that presentation, when evangelists are seeking an affirmative response to their message. In the remainder of this lecture, I want to share with you the proper way to end your gospel presentation and then discuss some common mistakes we need to avoid. Of course, the proper way to end a gospel presentation is God's way. After all, it's His evangelistic ministry. So I would like to share with you a few endings I have put together from actual gospel presentations in the Bible. Please listen as I read them to you. John the Baptist to his followers. John 3.36 He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. The Apostle Paul in the synagogue of Antioch. Acts 13.38-39 be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. The Apostle Paul before King Agrippa, Acts 26, 27-28. King Agrippa Believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Philip, to the eunuch, Acts 8.37. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And lastly, the apostle John, to me and you. John twenty thirty one, But these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that, believing, ye might have life through his name. First, I want you to notice that in each instance, after the gospel was presented, the evangelists ended their witness by laying a decision of faith in the gospel message at the door of those who heard them. This means when their presentation ended, the hearers were only left with two things. First, the message of the gospel they heard, and second, a decision for them to make as to whether or not they will stake their soul's eternity upon that message. But I also want you to notice that there is absolutely no outward physical action the hearers are asked to take. The only action that was encouraged was that inward spiritual response of faith in Jesus Christ. Now, since we are tripart beings, it is true that our spiritual response on the inside will often manifest itself physically on the outside. For example, someone who believes in Christ may tell God thank you for saving them and that they receive His Son. However, though a spiritual response may result in physical action. Physical action can never create a spiritual response. Mark this down. Faith always works from the inside out 
and never from the outside in. Please turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. In Mark, chapter 5, verses 25 through 24, we read, And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind, and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him, and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. In verse 34, underscore, Thy faith hath made thee whole. Here was a woman who had faith in Jesus Christ. In her heart, she believed that if she could only get to Jesus, if she could only reach the hem of his garment, she would be made whole. But did you notice how Jesus' disciples were shocked when Jesus asked, Who touched me? The disciples said, Lord, you see for yourself, this whole crowd is thronging you. People are all over you, Lord. So why would you ask, Who touched you? But in verse 30, we see the reason Jesus asked, Who touched him? He asked because he sensed that virtue, or literally miraculous power, had gone out from him and healed somebody. Now, brethren, there's a whole lot of rich doctrine here. You see, here were all these people touching Jesus. They were thronging Jesus, meaning they were pressed tied up against him. But then there was this one sick lady who barely even touched Jesus' clothes. And she was the only person made whole. And by this we learn that faith could cause one woman in the crowd to touch Christ. But a whole crowd of people touching Christ could not produce faith. This means our gospel presentation should not end with a call for them to touch, but a call for them to believe. What am I saying? I am saying we make a great mistake when, after sharing the gospel, we call for them to make an outward physical action when Jesus is calling for them to make an inward spiritual response. Jesus told her, Thy faith hath made thee whole. Again, faith may cause someone to touch, but touching will never cause faith. In fact, most of the people healed in the Bible were not healed by touching Jesus. For many, His word alone was sufficient for them. So it doesn't matter if people touch or don't touch, if they have a physical response, or just stand there and do nothing. What matters is if they believe. And if their faith causes them to touch like the woman, or cry out like the blind man, or just take Jesus at his word and walk away, 
like the sick of the palsy. Those things are only incidental to their faith and not causative to their healing. But in spite of this fact, much of the confusion experienced in church evangelism today comes as the result of evangelists trying to secure a physical response at the end of their gospel presentation, when they should be, after sharing what Christ has done, simply laying a decision of faith at the door of those who hear them. Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, 6, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And evangelists, you should not be in the business of prompting a physical response to a spiritual message. Do you remember the song leader I told you about, who told me he knew he was saved because he had done everything in Romans 10, 9 and 10? During the church service that night, his pastor preached a salvation message in which he gave a clear presentation of what Christ had done on the cross. However, because outward physical responses to the gospel, such as a trip down to the altar and a sinner's prayer for salvation, had long been encouraged in this pastor's church, the beautiful message the pastor preached that night fatally crashed when it tried to land. After hearing the good news of what Christ had accomplished for her on the cross, instead of simply resting in that good news, one woman believed that at the end of the message, she had to step out and walk down to the altar to try to get saved. With her altar worker and pastor by her side, she then began to cry out and ask God to save her, for she had been told she needed to do this. It was a loud, sad, and desperate cry that could be heard by everyone in the church. And I knew exactly what was happening, because I had been there before myself. You see, this wasn't her first trip to the altar. No, she had gone there a couple of times before and had prayed that same prayer those times too, just like she was told to do. And each time before, after she asked God to save her, she would get up in the waning strength of her emotions and tell the audience that she had just been saved. Only to later go home and in her confusion, began to doubt that she was saved. What was her solution? The same as before. Another trip down to the altar, another confession of her sins, and another prayer for salvation, each time being done with greater intensity than the last, hoping this time it would be the real thing. Church, what I just described to you is what a large percentage of people are experiencing in our churches. And all that pain and confusion is absolutely unnecessary. So let's talk about the altar call or invitation time at church. And I will try not to be offensive because I realize the altar call is sacred to many people. And I want to teach you, not offend you. But if you are one of these people, and the altar call is sacred to you, please remember that, like the Pharisees' washing of the hands, the altar call is only a tradition of your church, not a biblical mandate to your church. So, if you feel like throwing a stone at me during this lecture, all I ask is that you make sure you have a scripture on that stone before you throw it. Fair enough? From my youth, and sometimes even to the point of idolatry, I have heard preachers, 
romanticize the steps of the elevated platform or bench at the front of their church. In fact, for many church members, those steps are affectionately referred to as the altar. And in their minds, that's where people go to get saved or get things right with God. Many pastors even judge the strength of their sermons based on how many people go to this altar at the end of their service. I don't know how many times I have heard pastors say, we had a pretty good service this morning. We had several people down at the altar. Church leaders, God gave the book of Hebrews to get people away from Old Testament altars they couldn't save. And I believe the New Testament church made a great mistake when it started building new altars to take their place. Listen, brethren, those Old Testament altars were eternally replaced by the cross. The cross is where we find our offering and sacrifice. The cross is where people must go to be saved. The cross is the only place where we can die to sin and self, and not some bloodless altar that we invented. Because our fallen human nature is so prone to idolatry, I personally don't want to introduce anything into my church that has the potential to distract, confuse, or compete with the cross. Preachers have long encouraged trips down to the front of their church by telling people they need to come down to an old-fashioned altar, as if going to the altar gets them back to the faith of their fathers. When in actuality, the altar call was a new invention of the 19th century. The truth is, there is absolutely no biblical basis for the altar call. So, if you want an old-fashioned church, don't get your people to the altar. Get them to Jesus and get them back to the Word of God. Preachers, remember, we are dealing with people's souls here. People can be saved anywhere, and I personally believe we are doing our people a disservice when we try to cram the most important counseling session of a person's life into four stanzas of Just As I Am. But if you still choose to give an altar call after your sermon, at least always remember a good gospel message should lead someone to the cross and never make any connection in that person's mind between coming to the altar and coming to Jesus. If they understand the gospel you preached, they can trust in Christ right where they are. But if they still have questions, I personally recommend they be counseled somewhere privately after church so they don't feel rushed to make a decision before a song ends or be distracted by knowing everybody is staring at them. I personally never give the lost an invitation to come to the front of the church. Instead, I give them an invitation to meet with me or the associate pastor after church. Those who receive Christ as their Savior privately are then invited to come down to the front of the church at the end of the next service to make their new faith public. Now, I am not telling you that's how it needs to be done. I'm just telling you that's how I do it, and I offer that as a suggestion to you. But as long as you are following God's Word, that's what matters, and you do as God leads you. Okay, let's talk about another physical response that's often prompted by evangelists in the church, the sinner's prayer. When I speak to a church for the first time, I sometimes like to ask, for a show of hands, 
of how many people in the audience know they are saved. As in most churches, the majority of hands will go up. But after they put their hands down, I will then ask, out of all the people that just raised your hands, how many of you have either prayed for salvation and thought you were saved when you were younger, but later trusted in Christ and were saved as an adult? Or how many of you have prayed the sinner's prayer more than once in your lifetime, trying to get saved? Every time I have asked this question, there were hands that went up all over the audience. Understand then that these people were assured by their church leaders that if they prayed that sinner's prayer and meant what they prayed, they would be saved. However, they prayed it and meant it. But for a while, they were either still not saved or they were so confused they believed they were not saved. And either way, that result is completely unacceptable in evangelism. Like the altar call, we need to ask ourselves, where did this prayer come from? Most Christians assume the sinner's prayer can be found in the Bible. And, as often as it is used, one would think that the Word of God would be replete with scriptures about the sinner's prayer. However, there are actually only a handful of Bible verses used by sinner's prayer evangelists. Although many of them mistakenly quote Romans 10, 9, and 10 as their authority to promote this type of evangelism, we have already learned that these verses are not promoting a prayer, but faith in Jesus Christ. Since these passages were expounded in prior lectures, we won't readdress them again now, but we'll instead look at another popular scripture used to support the sinner's prayer. Please turn with me now to Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. In Revelation 3.20, Jesus tells the church of Laodicea, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. Instead of underlining something in this verse, as we usually do, I want you to notice what we are not underlining. Although the heart is never mentioned here, evangelists have taken this one passage and promised eternal life to untold thousands. If they would only open their heart's door to Jesus and invite Jesus to come into their heart. But brethren, just read the passage and you will see that this is very wrong. First of all, this text never mentions salvation or the heart. Second of all, the verse never says that Jesus will come into anybody. Look back in our text. Jesus says, I will come in to him. Notice that the words in and to are two separate words. Jesus says, I will come in to him, not come into him. Rather, like the vacated temple in the book of Ezekiel, it appears the Laodicean church had lost the presence of Christ. And Jesus is telling the church here that if any person would let him in, then he would come in and sup, or eat, with that person. The emphasis, then, is on fellowship, not regeneration. In fact, 
In this verse, there is nothing directly stated about forgiveness, the new birth, justification, or salvation at all. So, if we're not careful, we can read our own ideas into this passage and get the mechanics of the gospel completely backwards. Just think about it, brethren. Salvation does not come by Jesus entering through the door of the sinner. Salvation comes by the sinner entering through the door of Jesus. Jesus said in John 10, 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. May I humbly challenge you, Mr. Evangelist, and may I ask you an earnest question, dear student. Can you show me one instance in the Bible where either Jesus or one of his apostles ever led someone in a sinner's prayer? This question alone should settle the matter. Now remember, I am not asking you if you have ever read a scripture that made you think the sinner's prayer might exist. And I am not asking you if you have read where someone prayed. I am asking you, do you have a single Bible example where our Lord or one of his apostles, or anyone for that matter, ever led someone in a prayer for salvation. And if Jesus and the apostles did not do this in their day, then I humbly ask, upon what grounds are we doing this today? And may we not therefore conclude that this modern evangelism clearly differs from biblical evangelism. In fact, not only is the sinner's prayer absent from Scripture, I have personally never read a sinner's prayer in a sermon preached prior to the 20th century. The Bible says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, not through prayer. Remember the serpent on the pole that Jesus used to describe faith to Nicodemus. There was no promise of salvation made to any of those sin-bidden people, but to those who looked away from themselves and set their eyes upon that brazen serpent. Perhaps you're thinking, but some people may have prayed when they looked upon the serpent. Well, I suppose some might have prayed. But I suppose also that more of them probably coughed or cried or even scratched their noses when they looked. But what is that to us? The Bible says what it says. If a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. You see, had those people prayed or swung open the door of their heart to the serpent, they still could have died because there was no promise made concerning those things. But mark this down. There was not a single man who beheld that serpent who did not live. For by grace they were saved through beholding. Now, Jesus is no longer on the cross for us to behold. Rather, we now see him dying for us in the gospel record. Therefore, it is not with the eyes of our flesh that we must behold him. It is with the eyes of our faith. And though there may be many perish who pray, there will be none perish who believe on him. For Jesus said, Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. 
for as by grace they were saved through beholding. So by grace we are saved through believing. And this is why how we conclude our gospel presentation is so important. As the great reformer Martin Luther could not completely free himself from his Catholic roots, we too sometimes find it hard to part with things we have heard our whole lives. So some preachers, at the conclusion of their gospel presentation, instead of encouraging the people to simply believe and trust in the good news they just heard, they will often unintentionally divert the people's attention away from the finished work of Christ by telling them they need to invite Jesus into their heart or life or ask God to save them because they have heard this being done for so long. And this sometimes causes people to view what happened on the cross as only a prerequisite to salvation and view salvation as a future work to be requested rather than a finished work to be received. By misunderstanding the gospel this way, many people thus mistakenly rest their faith in something that was supposed to have happened to them when they prayed, instead of resting in what did happen for them when Christ died for their sins. When I was a new believer, my pastor gave me a key to the church building, and I often went there by myself to get alone with God and pray. But on one particular day, when I unlocked the door, I found that I was not alone. As I entered the vestibule, I saw our associate pastor, white as a sheet, staring back at me. He was terrified and miserable, and he was holding in his hand a popular gospel tract that has a step-by-step salvation plan with a sinner's prayer at the end. You see, when he was a boy, he had read that tract and followed the steps and prayed the prayer at the end. And now, years later, as an associate pastor, he found himself doubting his salvation. So, he had been reading this tract over and over again, trying to remember what happened to him at the end of the tract, so he could know whether or not he was saved. Now, friend, all of this could have been avoided if that tract would have simply taken him to the cross and left him there. This repeat-after-me, step-by-step salvation has confused so many people. Right now, there are people in churches wondering, Did I repent enough? Was I sincere enough? Did I pray the right thing? Did I follow the steps correctly? Did I, did I, did I? Now listen to me. There is only one question people need to be concerned with. And it's not did I. It's did he. Did he, Jesus, die? and rise again from the dead for me. In John 19.30, the Bible says, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Imagine with me for a moment that you were in trouble with the Internal Revenue Service for a large sum of back taxes you owe. Let's imagine that you have no money to pay these taxes, and the government has begun proceedings to seize your property and to put you in jail. Now you are afraid, and you are sitting all alone in your house, worried sick over this problem, when all of a sudden you hear a knock 
at your door. When you answer the door, a man tells you that he works for a very wealthy and benevolent businessman in town. He tells you, the man I work for heard about the terrible situation you were in, and he felt very sorry for you. So he wanted me to come here tonight and tell you he has taken care of everything. And then the man hands you a piece of good news. He hands you a receipt on official government letterhead showing your entire balance has been paid in full. The generous man has satisfied your debt on your behalf. Now, you look at the receipt and you recognize and believe that it is in fact a genuine government record and that your debt in your case, has been settled by the kindness of that good man. How do you suppose you would respond to this good news? If you really believed, you would probably cling to that letter and shout for joy, right? But what if, while you were in the middle of your celebration, the messenger decides to add, some of his own words to his master's message and says to you, Now, all you have to do is ask my boss to come into your home and save you from the Internal Revenue Service. Now, wouldn't that confuse you? Not only would it not make any sense but it would also infer that something else must be done by the man in addition to what is already done. Therefore, while at first you viewed the receipt as an absolute assurance of your deliverance, you now no longer can. In the same way, we want to make sure our gospel presentation never distracts from Christ's work on the cross. We want people to view the record of Christ's death in shed blood as the full pardon of their sin, so they can believe the good news and rest in it once for all. Church, we need to get people to stop looking to their prayers and to start looking to Jesus. Before I was saved, I set the world's record in sinner's prayers. Every time I doubted my salvation, I would say, Lord, if I'm not saved, please save me. Have you ever done that? I was so miserable. But when someone finally pointed me to the cross and showed me that my salvation was finished there. I finally saw that salvation was not something to be prayed for. It was something to take and enjoy. Jesus said in John seven thirty seven, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. All of that time I had been like a thirsty man standing at a well, begging for water, when I could have been enjoying the blessing of the man who dug the well.